Hi there. Hi. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, thank you. I'll be introducing you today. Oh, great. You're Rosa? Yes. I'm John, thank you. I'm gonna, nice meeting you. I think Isela's coming in. Let me put my little video back on here. Yeah, oh. she should be right here. There she is. Rosa, can you see my video screen there? Yes, I can. Great. John. <laughs> Hello, Isela. How are you? Nice to see you again. Good to see you. <laughs> I really appreciate your time. I really appreciate everything that you do for us. Oh, it's my pleasure. It is my pleasure. <laughs> I love seeing you guys. I was telling people today, I'm doing a workshop tonight in uh, Mexico. Uh -huh. Then I had to say, sadly, I'm not actually going to Mexico. I wish I were. <laughs> no, I understand. Uh, uh, I think you miss Tijuana. You miss Ensenada. I miss Mexicali. Mexicali. Tecate. Tecate. <laughs> of course. Ensenada. Ensenada. Yeah, I know. And Tijuana. Yeah, I miss Tijuana. Yeah. I miss all you guys. Yes. I remember, um, I think a month ago, yeah. Uh, who sent us the the picture where we were together? I think it was oh, Patty. Patty, uh -huh. Patty Guajardo. Long yeah. time. Rosa, we we met, I think, 20 years ago or more wow. than 20 years ago. How long, John? Yeah, it's almost 20. It's like almost 18, 20. 18 years wow, ago. Wow, that's impressive. Uh -huh. I've yeah. heard so much about you, but I didn't, I had no idea that you uh, guys met like since 20 years ago uh -huh. yeah it's been a long time yeah it's yeah, really I nice to hear it. it's pretty crazy <laughs> it's very <laughs> crazy yeah but we still miss you and we still love you <laughs> <laughs> Igualmente. Gracias. and how's your spanish john <laughs> yeah, it's okay <laughs> One of my sons, Christopher, is actually staying in Spain for a year. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So nice. He, is he there now or? He's there now. Yeah. Oh, okay. He, like last month. Okay. So I think you need to practice your Spanish. I think so. I'm going to go oh, visit him. Or I think you need him. a Spanish teacher. <laughs> That's right. Of course, he may speak with that Spanish accent. What are we going to do? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I... Yay. And my voice is not too loud or too soft, right? Oh, that's good. No, what time is it? Mm, uh, it's. Yeah, we're still, we got a few minutes. Still on time. Uh -huh. I realize sometimes if I get all worked up, I start shouting. So you got to let me know if I need to be. <laughs> okay. Hi, Tanya. Hi. Aquileo. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. <laughs> We're almost at the end of our program, John. And so you've morning, been having things the, today yeah. and yesterday or today? No, no, only today. Uh -huh. okay. We had three conferences in the morning and now in the afternoon, we, this is the second one and we have one more at seven. Oh, wow. It's a long day for you guys. Yeah, it was a long day for us. Okay. El Comité Organizador is tired. Well, <laughs> after this, you can take a little rest, right? Uh-huh. Good. A rest or a nice moment in Tecate. In Tecate. Nice. Con Tecate. In Tecate. Con uh. Tecate. Ah. Uh. Uh. I forget what they call the Guayamos, Cayamos, the big te Tecate. Ah, Kawama. Kawama. Ajá, uh -huh. Kawama. Ay, tapense los oídos los que están escuchando. <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. I somehow have it set up. I thought I had it set up so that people could just come in. But I have to actually admit people into this room. Uh -huh. Zoom it, is crazy. They always change things. You yeah. Know? And John, well, talking about that, we have some questions for you. Would you sure. like to ask, Rosa? Otras le regalamos. Um, okay, I think what we were going to ask you is uh, if 
are we allowed to share your email address at the end of the presentation? Not only are you allowed to, I'm going to put it up on the screen. Great, okay. excellent. Right. And another thing was, um, if you'd like, we uh, if you want to share, um, or if you want to put someone as a co-host, so we oh, can yeah. admit people while you while you're presenting. Let me do this. Okay, Isela, hey, I'm going to make you a co-host. Great. Okay. You want, you, Rosa, you want me to do you too? Yeah, yeah sure. Rosa, yeah, because Rosa, she's going to leave a few minutes uh, before the the ending of the presentation. We have one more. As yeah. soon as you finish this one, so he said it's gonna have to leave a couple of minutes earlier. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Hello, Patty. La Oca, John. Very nice to see you. You know, we were just talking. Did you send out that picture of us from that conference a few weeks ago? That was you, right? I thought yeah. so. Mm -hmm. A beautiful memory. Thank you. I know. You're welcome. <laughs> long time yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. i know everyone was like when was that where was that oh my god <laughs> i think it was mexicali i, I think. believe it was mexicali yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah but wow. we were uh we were discussing about how many years 20 how long ago Ooh, i don't know how long ago uh -huh. 20 i don't know well, that picture i think was from around 2005 maybe yeah about 10 years i think and then, more or less. Well, I met you guys back in 2003. So now, uh, who who is are is everyone here? Are they teachers? Or, or what is the who's who's here? Who's here? Rosa, would you like to answer or Patty? Go ahead. What do you mean by who's here? Well, are these people who are in your, are they students? Are they teachers? Oh, both. They, both. Okay. Uh -huh. both. Uh, well, not exactly students. I mean, they're, um, they're graduate students. Uh -huh. Okay. So they're like in their the master's program? Uh, probably some of them. We don't know exactly, but probably some of them are mm -hmm. or right. have already finished the master's. So, oh, wonderful! Yeah. yeah, because we invited um, uh, well, students that already finished with us, that already uh, finished our programs, uh, master's program or bachelor program. So we don't know exactly who's right now. Okay. Well, I also want to make make sure everybody knows if it's okay with you. I'm recording this, so I can send you the recording. Yeah, please. Yeah, that'll be great. Yes, okay. thank you. Just so everybody knows that it's being recorded. Yeah. Great, thank you. So um, I think, so I think we can start. Okay. Mm -hmm. There we are. Okay. Um, okay. Are yeah. Are you ready, Mr. Bunting? So we can start. I'm ready. <laughs> ok, bueno pues uh, muy buenas tardes a todos, sean todos ustedes bienvenidos, les voy a pedir de favor antes de iniciar si nos hacen el, el, el favor de tener, uh, mantener su micrófono apagado y la cámara apagada una vez que iniciemos este, con la presentación para no interrumpir a la conferencia. Eh, pues la Universidad Autónoma de Baja California y la Facultad de Idiomas les dan las, la más cordial bienvenida al Encuentro Internacional de Egresados en el cual participan egresados, docentes y alumnos de las diferentes sedes de nuestra facultad. Asimismo, le damos la bienvenida al ponente, el doctor John Bunting de Georgia State University, quien nos presenta la conferencia virtual Challenges in Moving and Keeping an Intensive English Program. So let me tell you a little bit um, about Dr. Uh, John D. Bunting, who is a principal senior lecturer and director of the Intensive English Program at Georgia State University, where he has taught since uh, 2001. His areas of interest include teacher training, corpus linguistics, and the use of technology in second language teaching and learning. His most recent books, co-authored with the wonderful Dr. Luciana Dennis, and using corpus materials developed by Dr. Randy Reepen are Grammar and Beyond Essentials 4 in 2019 and Grammar and Beyond 4 second edition in 2021. Both published by Cambridge University Press, Dr. Bunting has worked extensively 
on online teacher training for EFL teachers in Mexico, collaborating with an amazing group of teachers and teacher trainers from the National Pedagogical University in Mexico City. His most recent projects include creating a massive open online course on English communication for health professionals for healthcare workers across Africa. Conducting teacher training workshops in Qatar focused on and developing a legal English center in Turkey. He has given workshops and presentations on vocabulary, technology, and specialized language instruction, instruction in the US and in various countries around the world. In Atlanta, he has developed a community-based program to reach immigrants regardless of immigration status so they can achieve academic and professional success in the US. As a part uh, of this initiative, he has created a nonprofit program to support resource challenged immigrants and refugees. Muy bien. Ahora le cedemos la palabra al Dr. Bunting y al final de la con conferencia tendremos un espacio para sus preguntas o comentarios. Les recuerdo el registro a nuestras conferencias se realiza en el link que les vamos a proporcionar en el chat. En caso de que no se hayan registrado, lo pueden hacer en este momento o al final. Okay, Dr. Bunting, you may start. Great. Thank you so much, Rosa. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, yo hablo un poquito de español, pero uh, yo no voy a dañar el idioma tanto y voy a hablar en inglés. <laughs> so I am uh, so happy to be here with you. I, as I was just mentioning with a couple of the wonderful folks here, how uh, we have a very long and wonderful uh, history together. Uh, going back a number of years. Um, so I have great admiration and uh, uh, just friendship with many people from UABC. And it's wonderful to be here with you guys. And thank you, Rosa, for that, uh, that description of things that I've, I have done and I'm trying to do. Uh, and um, I really appreciate that. Uh, I want to, I'm going to talk a little bit about the process that we have been going through here at Georgia State University, where I'm a lecturer, and I'm also the director of our English program. Um, and as I'm doing it, I mean, I think we've all been facing a lot of challenges, <laughs> to say the least, over the last uh, year or two. Um, and I think for those of us as uh, teachers, it's been especially challenging. You know, there are things that we we and our students did not realize we were going to have to deal with. Um, so as, as I'm going through here, if questions come up, you can pop them in the chat room. We'll look at them later. Um, if I see something that jumps out at me, maybe we can stop and talk for a second. Uh, but I, you know, I'm, I'm respectful of your time. So I want to talk a little bit and then you guys talk in a little bit. Now, uh, I, you know, I was reflecting on this whole thing dealing with technology and online teaching. And I realized the first time I actually did this was back in the year 2000. Um, I, I was working, I was a graduate student and I started working with Columbia University uh, doing online business English to Japanese students. Uh, and it's nothing like we're doing now. It was, it was a kind of like a glorified text message system. Uh, so we're very fortunate that we have some of the things we have now that were not available back then. Um, and so there was a time, March 2020, when things changed a little bit for most of us. And I want and in our IEP, which is the intensive English program, there it was no different. Things changed dramatically for us. So what I want to do here is talk about some of the highs and lows of that experience. And I'm, I also want to talk about the story that has not really uh, been written yet, because it's what are we going to do in our post-pandemic approach after having this crash course in uh, using technology in our language teaching. Um, so let me first talk a little bit about our program. Our program, excuse me, is an intensive English program at Georgia State University, which is the largest university in the state of Georgia. <coughs> excuse me. And it's 
uh, one of the largest in the country. We have over 50,000 students. And uh, it, is, it has five levels and five different skills-based courses. The first two levels we have are general English and the high, three highest levels are focused on academic English. And we actually use university level content to teach most of these higher level courses. Uh, for example, we have an oral communication class that explores US government while also looking at supra segmentals and different and, and word stress and stress, things like that. And the reason why we chose that is we wanted to have uh, content that was going to be related to what students were going to have to face in their undergraduate classrooms. We also have content based courses in environmental science, uh, psychology, history, marketing, a whole bunch of different things. Um, we also um, have had thousands of students go through our program, so I'm very proud of it. Uh, and they've gone on to six, most of, not all, but most have gone on to successful academic and then professional careers. So we're very proud of that. We have a student-centered communicative approach. Um, and so we, when we had to look at this transition to the online environment, that part of it was a little bit scary for us. How, you know, it was a challenge. How are we gonna do this? It's not like you're just gonna do straight lectures and students can just sit there and listen. We wanted to have, we wanted to continue to use our trademark um, use of pair work and group work and lots of moving around. And we were thinking, how, how in the world are we going to do this with online materials? As I mentioned before, if as we're going along, if anything, any you come up with any thoughts or any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat room and we can look at them at the end. So everyone can see that screen of mine, right? So I'm very happy yes. students at Georgia State. Are you changed? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there it is. Uh, this young gentleman, <laughs> this is a picture of me in March 2020. And full disclosure, that was not my favorite month. Oops, wait, wait, wait. Sorry, it jumped on me there. Uh, one thing I did discover was that I like to bake bread, which I think many people found out that, that month and months after that. But one of my worries was trying to figure out how we were going to pivot from this 20 year tradition of in person classes to this completely new online model. So I'm, the next couple slides I want to show you are modified from a zoom session that I had with our teachers at that right literally the week everything shut down on March 15th or so of last year. And we were trying to make sense of what was happening and how we would move forward. Um, and then one of the things that we did try to emphasize to each other, as well as to our students, is that we were not alone, even though we all of us probably felt quite alone sitting there alone in our houses. So uh, we focused on the reality that this was not a perfect situation. And we could <laughs> We couldn't let a, the unattainable perfect stand in the way of an attainable pretty good, especially under these conditions. Now, the teachers were rightly concerned and it sometimes felt like it could be so easy to shift, to veer into this overwhelming or overpowering negative thing, like nothing's gonna work, everything's falling apart. Um, so one of the things that we tried to do is we focused on these four areas as we planned our shift. <clears throat> First thing we wanted to try and make sure was that we were going to, as best we could, remember, we're not gonna let the perfect stand in the way of the pretty good. We're gonna try and meet our learning outcomes for our students. Maybe we're not gonna be able to hit all of them in this new environment, but we're gonna try. The other thing, uh, another key element was that we would be aware of the students' frustration and the students' anxieties, uh, because that also is something that is, you know, along with us feeling nervous and uncertain, our poor students. One of the things um, for us, our students are, we're coming from a very, you know, they, most of them are international students. So their families were far, far away. 
and they couldn't get home to them. Um, and, you know, so they didn't know exactly what was going on with them. Um, another thing was we wanted to try and explore the different ways that we could engage, whether it was in a Zoom session, like what we're doing now, or through asynchronous online uh, systems, phones, all of these things, uh, you know, leaving messages in a tree. No, we didn't do that. And then the other thing was, through all of this, we wanted to try to have fun and try to project to our students calm and show compassion to them. Because, you know, teachers, we can get pretty strict sometimes. And sometimes that's called for, and sometimes you have to be a little bit kinder to our students. So um, we were trying, as we met in those early days, we were trying to recall what had worked before in our limited online experiences, because we'd been doing a few things online, uh, but we hadn't really made a major push into it. Um, and then we also focused on the things that we thought we might be able to translate directly uh, into by going online. Um, one of the things that we did was we just did a lot of brainstorming, no judgment. We just did a lot of brainstorming to explore things that we might be interested in trying. And we, you know, we didn't know if we could do it or not. So we talked about like, should we have teachers come into the classroom and pretend there were students there and have and be standing in front of a whiteboard and writing things on the board, those kinds of things. You know, we ended up not doing that, but we we did a a lot of brainstorming to just see what were the what are some possible things that might work. Um, teachers. Uh, had a lot of questions as we were going into this. One of them for us, and I don't know if this is true for you guys or not, but we, you know, we want to make sure students attend because when they attend, they do better. And if students start missing class, they really, their, their um, progression really falls off. Um, so we were thinking, well, how are we going to sort of measure attendance? How strict are we going to be? What's it, what does that look like? Um, and then are we going to still try and meet at the same time to keep it what we call synchronous as opposed to asynchronous? Or are we going to just have things open so that students can come in and out whenever they want? Um, and what are we going to do if students don't have technology? You know, how, how is it going to work for somebody who doesn't have a really good laptop or they don't have internet? And we had literally, we had, we had students who would go to a Starbucks and they would be taking class there. So, you know, they'd have to like put the, the mute on because there were people around them talking, ordering lattes and things. Hello there. <laughs> um, and then we also were wondering, you know, not just for our students, but also our instructors. Some of us realized we had old computers in our houses and all this new software is not working so well with our old equipment. Um, and is the university gonna pay for new equipment? Are we gonna just not use it? Are we gonna have to put money out, all that? And then for us, and for some of you, you know, if you're working in an institution, we had to figure out, you know, is it okay for us to use things that are not given to us by the university? Um, and what's interesting is right now we're on a Zoom call. I actually pay for this Zoom account myself because our university won't do it. And so some of us, we decided, well, we're just gonna have to do it. And let me tell you, as teachers, we don't like to spend money if we don't have to, but that's what it is. So these were some of the things. And there's also that question, a big question, as it turned out for us, assessment. Now, my friend Isela and I talked about assessment last year because um, it was it's a big issue. You know, the, what you see on your screen here, this is a picture of me proctoring a placement exam for one of our students, one of our incoming students. Um, and this was where we had to shift the entire placement test online. And we, you know, we actually made it hybrid. So um, there were online multiple choice questions. We had a recorded Zoom session like this, just one on one to do the interview and to do the listening items. Um, and then what's in the picture here is uh, poor Vanessa here. She's writing her essay, knowing that I'm watching her on a video screen while she's writing it, 
on paper and then she takes a picture of it and sends it to me because we were trying to think well how are we how are we going to stop you know people from just copying and pasting from somewhere else or whatever so we went really old school with an an iphone twist to it um and it it kind of felt weird sitting there in front of them as they wrote their essays although at that point everything was feeling pretty strange but we were we were concerned about a lot of issues in terms of assessment you know you know how, how are we going to grade their homework are we going to have modifications to it um their in-class writing if they have to do that um Pre or spoken presentations, uh, the, the tests, what do we do about the issue of cheating you know, um, and grading? And that still continues to be a challenge uh, for online. Although I think we've, we've really made a shift in how we look at it. And um, uh, as I mentioned, Isela and I, we, we had a presentation about this last, I think it must've been about this time last year. And I think there are a lot of creative ways to get around that. But it was a big, big issue. So as I mentioned, our teachers brainstormed ideas. They were talking about, well, we can make videos using the phones. Uh, we can do lectures combining with PowerPoints and then putting them up on YouTube, all this high tech stuff. We had some software where you can make these quiz activities. Um, you know, there are also free ones like Quizlet and things like that. Um, finding and connecting to relevant and appropriate uh, input for our students that's available outside of our classes, which is, can also be a challenge because you got to be careful what's out there on the internet. Um, you know, actually, and I don't tell the publishers, you know, they mentioned I work with Cambridge University Press. Please don't tell them. Taking photographs of textbook pages to use sometimes in these classes um, and then using other tools uh, that can help with that. And what we would do then is we would meet and talk about the specific courses and the specific uh, tools to see how things might work. So one of the things we had was like using a chat room. Uh, and, you know, for some courses, especially the writing courses that worked really well. For others, we didn't need to use it quite as much. And the other thing that we discovered was that uh, some things worked really well for some teachers. They really, they bought into it, they were good at it, and they, they just flourished. But the same tools for other teachers, they just could not stand them or they couldn't get them to work. And I remember one poor teacher, oh, bless her. You know, she'd be like, I feel so bad because every, every day it's like about 20 minutes, my students have to be waiting for me while I try and figure out how to turn something on. Yeah. We can't let the perfect stand in the way of the pretty good. Uh, so we, we, we did it. We had no choice. We went fully online on a March 21st or so. And then we did our entire summer, our entire fall, and our entire spring of this year, 2021, all online, uh, trying to keep people healthy. And we had some real challenges. One of the things we found is our upper level courses worked really well. Our lower level courses were not quite so successful. It, it, it was really hard. I think in part, just giving instructions was difficult and we just had a much harder time. We, we also found, you know, trying to keep students in the class. And it's interesting because, you know, Rosa was saying to everybody at the beginning of our talk here, please turn off your video. Well, in our classes, we would always say, please don't turn off your video because people would love to turn off their video. And then it's just a teacher there alone. Um, so, you know, we wanted to keep them in the class uh, and making sure, trying to turn their video on. And I, I get it too, because I know there are times when I'm in my, you know, we have so many meetings now on Zoom and I don't necessarily want people to be seeing me as I'm listening to them talk. So it makes sense. But for the classes, um, we needed to, we wanted to keep them engaged that way. We also had to figure out how do we assess what they're doing if we put them into a breakout room or if we have them do pair work, how do we, how do we determine if things are successful or not? Um, another thing is, and you can see there's a little close up here from this picture, 
stress. You know, our students, man, they were, it was, it's hard. I mean, it was hard for all of us, but I think for the students, it could, it could be really, really hard. And we, you know, we, we tried to be very aware of that, but it just, it was what it was. Um, and then we also had, of course, technical issues, you know, where, where people was, you know, they'd be talking and they, see what I mean? <laughs> you just start freezing up or something. Um, and uh, so there were a lot of challenges. Fortunately, we had some successes as well, though. Um, one of the things is that I think for most, almost all of us, we were able to master the tools of Zoom. People were able to use polls, you know, where you could ask questions, little surveys. We used breakout rooms. We had small groups and pairs and things like that. Uh, we were able to do recordings, like I'm recording our session right now, and then I'm going to be able to share it with you. The set that we did the same thing. We had a policy. Everything that we did was going to be recorded so that if people were missing it, whether they they had COVID or they had to take care of somebody or their computer stopped working or they lost their internet, they'd still be able to get that, that content. And working on things like sharing your screen, uh, you know, things like that. The other thing, one of the big successes is that even though we were in this rough environment, we, in a lot of cases, were able to really connect with students. You know, we were able to, you know, get students engaged with the material, with each other. You know, people actually built a community even though we were in this online and stressful environment. Um, I, and I also think that the compassion that teachers were able to show was also a big success that they were aware of what students were going through and they, they dealt with that very appropriately and sensitively. Um, and then they, they, um, they also uh, showed a lot of creativity. I mean, I was doing some classes too and I look at what other teachers did and I said, wow, man, these guys, they're incredible. Um, and, you know, and like I said, most of our students did very well. It wasn't all of them. Of course, in our regular classes, and you probably have the same situation, not everybody does well, um, but they managed to have fun and they managed to learn. Um, and some of our teachers, and interestingly enough, a couple who were really just furiously opposed to all of this by the end of the second or third semester, they didn't want to go back to real classrooms. They liked not having to drive anymore. So it was hard to get them to come back. Um, and so the question is, you know, I want to talk a little bit about moving beyond this pandemic, because I think we are getting beyond it little by little. I'm going to hold up, hold out hope. Uh, and for us, what we have been doing is we had a, um, a gradual return to in-person classes. As I mentioned, spring 2021, we were fully online. There was no option to come downtown to our, our, our university. We are now, uh, and then in the summer, we did three days in, in person, two days uh, online. And the reason why we did that is we also, you know, there's le uh, varying levels of comfort about the whole situation, varying levels of risk for individual people, whether our students or our teachers might have had uh, health risks, or they might be living with people that had health risks. And we didn't want to prohibit those people from participating. So we gave it, you know, we had the three, three days on, three days in person, two days online, but we also gave students the option that they could go fully online uh, as well. And then this semester right now, we are back fully in person uh, for our classes. Uh, and, you know, with variants of COVID and all that, we don't know exactly what the future holds, but uh, we're going to look at what might be coming with 2022. I'm optimistic that the return to fully in person is here to stay, but we'll see. So the next question is, what's, what's next for all of this? What I'm going to call online success. We did have a great deal of success with it. 
We had a lot of students. They got through the program. Maybe not ideal, but they got through and they learned and now they're in academic programs. So what we're doing now is we're looking at um, in dealing with an online component for our program. We have a case by case um, structure so that if there are quarantining students, you know, we can figure out a way for them to continue studying uh, in some manner. Um, and we haven't had many of those, thank goodness. Uh, one of the other things though, that has been a result of this process is that we now use a lot more online tools much more effectively in our traditional in-person classes. So we've kind of expanded the, the range of tools that we can use for our traditional classes, because we now have all this experience with things like Zoom and the learning management systems and all of that. We also, because we're still a little nervous here about COVID, uh, we're, we are encouraging online office hours so that teachers and students, rather than getting close together to talk about things, we still have that as an option, but we encourage them to do online uh, office hours if that helps uh, and a lot more online professional development oh, like this you know where we're able to meet people and you know talk about things you know it's not the same as being there in person and there is something wonderful about being in person and i hope i hope i can come to uave in person someday soon but there is a lot of opportunity for something like this and you, you know, these things make it a lot more, uh, there's a lot more opportunity for a lot more people, which is good. Uh, so, and one of the other things that we're looking at is um, because we now have this experience, we're actually, we're gonna be starting an online aviation English course for students from a nearby school. Uh, with, and we'll have in-person field trips, but all the course will be online. And it works out great for them because they're at their other, their other institution, but they can take these classes with us online. We're also looking at online only classes for students outside the US. So for example, we have a partner in Ecuador and we are setting up a whole series of courses that we're gonna be able to offer to students in Ecuador and they'll be online. Obviously it's not the same as if you're in person You'd, and you don't have the immersion that you certainly it, it's nice to have when you have people who can come to the United States, like if people come to Atlanta and they're in an ESL environment, English as a second language, as opposed to the EFL, English as a foreign language. Um, but it still gives a lot more opportunity to in, engage with native speakers, to engage with different styles of teaching and learning. So I think that that's, that's not bad. Um, and I, before I, I, I you know, we, we're, I think we're going to, we can talk, have some questions or something if you'd like, but I did want to mention one of our most successful online initiatives and Rosa mentioned it briefly in the bio. And I appreciate that during the pandemic. Well, before the pandemic, we had been setting up a massive open online course for health professionals, but during the pandemic, it actually became so much more critical. And we actually did a, we, we ran the program through the summer of 2020. And we had three or 400 different health professionals from all across Africa who were doing this online course that we developed all about um, uh, health, English communication for health professionals. Um, and this is, uh, this, this picture here is, we did a part, as part of the course, there was a, uh, uh, a, um, a campaign to get people washing their hands. So we had people from all over Africa and actually people from other parts of the world too participated um, where they would send in the photographs, you know, we're trying to encourage in their local communities, good hygiene practices with washing hands. Um, and one of the things for me, the, you know, the summer of 2020 was a, was a grim time, but this particular project was a really, warm spot in what was a, a pretty bleak moment 
Uh, be, and, and it really had a positive impact on all those health professionals who were taking the courses, you know, because they were able to uh, inter interact with people from all over in English about the, the situation that they were in and also learn some interesting things. So that's enough about me. What about you? What are your thoughts here? Um, and I guess Rosa and uh, Isela, if she's still here, I don't know if you guys, if there are questions that are, have come up or what's up. Well, we have t about 10 minutes okay. to, for questions and answers. I don't know if any of the attendants would like to write the, their questions on the chat or perhaps raise your hand or just activate your microphone. Okay, uh, Aquileo Rodriguez has a question. Okay, great. Thank Adelante, you. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Mr. Bunting. It was, it was a, a great lecture. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I, I know that the main idea was to share with us your experience teaching online during this pandemic. But we have come to realize that despite where in the world we are, our students and ourselves, we have started to go through anxiety and, and lots of stress. And when reading one of your first slides about your goals, I love the one that says, have fun in Project Common Compassion, particularly the part about compassion, because I think it is one of the things that some of us even discovered that we had in us. So how deep are we allowed to go as teachers into this emotional part? I mean, we are humans and it, it has been hard, particularly when you have to say goodbye to a student that couldn't fight against COVID or, um, I don't know, deal with students that must let go on a friend, a classmate, a relative. And we try not to engage, but we are all living this situation. And I guess that the new normality will be everything but normal. So uh, I would like to know if you don't mind sharing with us, what has been your experience regarding this human part as, as a teacher? You know, al alquileo, yeah? Alquileo, that's a, that's a wonderful uh, comment that you've, you've made. And I think you're touching on what I think is actually one of the most important aspects of what we've all gone through in the last 18 months. Um, and, you know, I think we have a myth of, of our teachers that we have to be really objective and almost not, not exactly depersonalized, but, but we can't get too involved. And there's, there's some, you know, there's, there's some logic behind that. But I do think what one thing certainly for me personally, and I think for people in our program is we saw in this, during the pandemic, you know, we had people suffering from just really, really difficult things. And, you know, it, it's, there's such a, there's a balancing act that we have to, we have to do, you know, because we want to acknowledge it and we want to honor what they're suffering with. But we also want to make sure that is maybe we can provide them with some respite, some moment to forget their, their, the, the terrible things that they're dealing with and have some moments of, of levity or something. And it's hard, you know, it's hard to balance that. My personal view, and, and this is not something that I think each teacher, you know, we all, we all have our own, um, our own personality and our own definition of self as a teacher. And I don't think we can separate, uh, real teachers can't separate who you are as a person and who you are as a teacher. And so, I mean, my feeling is it's appropriate and it is healthy to acknowledge when people are suffering and to acknowledge that, you know what, it's hard for me to focus on the present perfect if my aunt is dying, you know, or if I've just lost my grandmother. So those kinds of things, you know, we as professionals and as human beings, I think we have to be able to figure out, you know, where's the balance there? We, we don't want to just focus on that, but we also want to give it the moment that it requires. You know, I've had students, I mean, I have 
you know, heartbreaking stories that students have, have, have shared with me over the past 18 months. And, you know, you can't just say, well, just do your homework. <laughs> you know, you have to be, <coughs> excuse me, you have to be compassionate. And, and, you know, if people need a little more time, they need a little more time. You know, that's not going to hurt anything. And in the long run, you know, they're going to be, it, we're going to be better people. They're going to be better people if they're able to, to do that. So I'm really glad you brought that up because to me, that's one of the most important things. And some of the things that for us in our program as a faculty, we struggle with because, you know, we also were seen as, you know, we have to keep our rules. We have to keep, you know, we have our requirements, our learning outcomes. Um, but sometimes you have to, you have to weigh what's really important. Thank you. Thank you, Akilio. Um... Rosa, I have another question here. I received a question. Go ahead. Uh, let me see. Doctora Erika Martinez. Uh, did you have a significant percentage of dropouts? How did that impact the motivation of both teachers and students? What did the institution do about it? Excellent question. That was from Erica, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, surprisingly, we didn't really have a whole lot of dropout where people just stopped coming. But we did have a, a slight increase in people that kept coming, but they sort of stopped engaging, you know, where, where people would not, um, they come and And to be honest, and I think, again, to go back to what Alquileo was saying, if you can develop trust or a, a, a sense of, a, 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 if you can communicate with your students, they'll let you know what's going on. So I had, I had a student and she was actually from Mexico and she had some really painful things going on in her life in Mexico that, that she could not go to, she couldn't travel there. And, and she said, John, I'm gonna come to class, but I, don't ask me to talk and I'll just try and do this stuff, you know, because it was something that for her, it was weighing so heavily that it, it was not, it, I could have, I could have been a jerk, frankly, you know, and said, well, I'm going to make you talk or something. And then she would have left, but she was able to, you know, you know, she was there, she did the work, she would put things in the chat room, but, you know, I, I gave her that space and then she stayed and she was able to get through. Now, some of our students um, weren't able to pass. And, and I think sometimes it was because they just had too many things. You know, how in the world can you focus on, on you know, language learning when you feel like your world is falling apart or your family is falling apart? So one of the things that we did is we also, we provided, you know, because our program is not cheap. It's not really expensive in terms of the United States, but in terms of most of the world, it's very expensive. So people are, you know, people and their families are devoting a lot of resources to this. So what we did was if someone was in that situation, we let them take the next semester again without charge, you know, because, you know, I mean, it's, it's just the right thing to do. And it also, that's going to keep them going and, really, and I've said this to my students sometimes, you know, if, if you're, you know, what's important in life and your family is important, you know, and that's where, you know, we all have to, to go back to what Alquilea was saying, you know, we have to have some compassion and, and some sense of what's right. I, did I answer that question, Isela? I, Erika Martinez, Erica. what do you think? Yes, thank you very, very much. Great. Thank you for that question. Um, also, we have a comment here from Tanya. Tanya, would you like to read your comment? Or if you want to open your microphone. Hi, Tanya. <laughs> well, well, if, if you want, I can. <laughs> yeah, read it out loud. I can read the comment if you want. Thank you. Sure. Okay, Go so ahead. I wrote, uh, thank you for sharing this information. I feel identified with the issues and struggles that you mentioned. 
Um, but, I'll, but also with the successes regarding to technology, I'm also one of those teachers who purchased Zoom. <laughs> And uh, well, at the beginning of the pandemic, I felt uh, anxious and it was very hard for me because I also knew that I needed to make my students feel comfortable within our new context. And uh, this uh, conference is very interesting uh, uh, to, to hear about this information, even though that we teach in different countries, we, we share the same experiences. So thank you for sharing. That's wonderful, Tanya. Yeah, and I, I, I um, you know, I'm, I, when you mentioned that anxiety, um, you know, it's interesting because it also is, you know, we've been talking about us kind of being the rock and our students being the ones that are struggling, but we are too. Yes. All of us are struggling. You know, we're all trying to make sense of this and, we all have those same worries and everything. Um, so, I mean, and it is, I think it, it's, a, it's a great, uh, I don't know if I would call it a skill, but to be able to present that sort of calm and compassionate rock to your students is great. But we also have to acknowledge we're not rocks. <laughs> <We're people. Yes. laughs> you know, and so, and one of the things that we've tried to do in our program is as a faculty, we've been reaching out to each other, you know, because it is, it's so easy to just feel like, and, and I've had, and teachers have said this to me and I felt it myself, but I'll never tell them. You know, you feel like here I am trying to teach on, online, I'm a fraud. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know what I'm doing here. I, you know, why would, why are these poor students having to put up with me? As well as all the other things like, you know, is my family okay? Are we gonna be okay? You know, all these things. Um, and, but I think it is so, it's useful to articulate, like what, what you did, Tanya, you know, to articulate that, that these are the things that we're, we're feeling, because so is everybody else, you know. Um, and hopefully we'll, we have people, the administrators or whoever it is that we have to deal with, let's hope that they also show that compassion for us. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tanya. Thank you, John. Um, well, some comments in the chat. Would you like to read them, Rosa, or? Go ahead. Uh, empathy empathy uh -huh, has become the new skill, says Lau. Aquileo, I totally agree. Patricia Wajardo, that's right. Well, I think we are on time, just on time, right, Rosa? Yes, yes, we are. If there aren't any other questions that you would like to ask, uh, Dr. Bunting said he was going to leave the, the email address in case you want to ask him something later on. Yeah, I, I am always happy to talk to anybody from Baja, California. <laughs> <laughs> and I, my, I put my email in the chat. It's also up there on the screen. Great. Thank um, you. Because one of the things and, you know, one of those very first slides. And for me, it's very important. And that's why I put it up there. You're not alone, you know. I mean, even in the best of times, being a teacher is hard. <laughs> uh, but thank you guys so much for your participation. Thank you, John, for your yeah. time and being here. Um, Rosa. Thank you. We really appreciate uh, you taking the time to, to present today to this very important event. Um, on behalf of the, of the university, we really thank you. Um, le agradecemos mucho la participación al Dr. Banting en este evento y por supuesto, pues también la participación de todos ustedes, nuestros egresados, docentes aquí presentes y público en general. Um, nos queda una conferencia más eh, ahorita a las 7. Entonces, pues serán todos bienvenidos también quien gusta acompañarnos, ¿verdad? Les vamos a pedir nada más si pueden activar su cámara unos minutitos, un segundito para tomar una fotografía de, de, de recuerdo. Por favor. Oh, yeah. Here, let me, let me uh, delete my little thing here. Hold on. <laughs> Stop sharing. Oh, yes. There we go. That's, that's better. Salvador. Okay. Um... Hold on, hold on. I want to take a picture too. Oh. Okay. You can all smile. Okay. Um, 
in three, two, one, smile. Ready. Thank you. Enjoy. <laughs> I do love it. Well, thank you guys. Please be thank safe. Thank you, John. And I hope I can see you all again sometime in Mexicali, Mexicali. Or Tijuana, or Ensenada, or Tecate. Con un tecate. Con una tecate. Una tecate. Una tecate. Bye, Thank guys. you, John. Thank bye. you so much. Bye bye. Nice bye. meeting you. Thank bye you bye. So much. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you nice too. To meet you.